Good morning. Good morning. My name is Leslie Polgar, and my pronouns are he and him. Movies and history are two of my favorite subjects, and this morning I weave them together to share some ideas about leadership, individual responsibility, and what we are called on to do amid today's chaotic events. I found this weaving to be difficult. The two threads are so different. History is woven fine, but movies are made of a coarser fiber. As a new immigrant kid, I enjoyed the YMCA in Montreal's Notre Dame de Grasse district. It was only a half mile from our house and one street over from my grade school. It was great for sports. Soccer in spring, softball in summer, football in autumn, and best of all, ice hockey in winter. For hockey, I was the goalie. I had shin pads, but no mask or helmet. The Y also provided weekly entertainment. For three summers, I would go Tuesday nights to their bonfires, which consisted primarily of movies shown outdoors. In winter, the movies moved indoors on Saturday mornings. And so I got the cinema bug, along with a fondness for the Marx Brothers. I can still elicit a groan from Sue whenever I stream their 1935 classic, A Night at the Opera. <laughs> their duck soup was earlier. It was released in November of 1933, and as with all Marx Brothers movies, it is slapstick with terrible puns and even some offensive vaudeville humor. But duck soup is more than that. It's a brilliant satire of inept political leadership. Not everyone was amused. Mussolini, who had already been in power for 11 years, banned it from Italy. How many of you have seen duck soup? Just a show of hands. Okay. You need to know that before the Marx Brothers made their movie, the term duck soup meant something that was easily accomplished. In a nutshell, the story goes like this. The country of Fredonia is broke. The people are restless. The powers that be ask its richest citizen, a Mrs. Teasdale, to lend it $20 million. But she will only agree if they name Rufus T. Firefly, Groucho, who's on the screen before, as Fredonia's leader a bit of political machination. Firefly re leads Fredonia into a war with neighboring and equally inept Sylvania. If you haven't seen Duck Soup, give it a try. Whether by design or coinc coincidence, though, many of the movies that I saw at the YMCA in Montreal were about people who, against both odds and expectations, chose to speak up and act as individuals, as leaders. Frank Capra's 1939 movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, with Jimmy Stewart as the idealistic young man sent to fill a vacant Senate seat, is a wonderful cinematic example of an ordinary citizen of whom little is expected. Indeed, the cynical and corrupt political bosses who back him expect and want little. But Smith's honesty and initiative win in the end. This is Hollywood and Frank Capra, after all. But those traits that Smith showed in the movie did have historical resonance six years later in the person of Harry Truman, of whom very little was expected. So back to Montreal. My father died less than a year after we emigrated from Budapest to Montreal. A couple of years later, my mom remarried an American citizen, a widower, who had been a close college friend of my father. So four months after my 10th birthday, we moved to Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Stepdad George was a gruff but kindly man who, among other things, patiently taught me how to use tools. But more important to me at that time was that he owned a television. 
As an immigrant for the second time in three years, I wanted to learn about my new country. This was also a good excuse to be allowed more TV time than the official parental limit of one half hour a day. I happened to find a weekly TV series on ABC called The Cavalcade of America. As the web website IMDB notes, it documented historical events using stories of individual courage, initiative, and achievement. And courage is one of the missions of this church we heard at the beginning of the service. Now these were decidedly feel-good episodes aimed at white middle-class audiences. Thankfully, and much belatedly, the demographics of admirable heroes seen on both the small and the large screen have widened in the decades since. At its core, what I got from Cavalcade is that the strength of America arises from the fact that leaders come from all walks of life and from all over this vast land. Not the usual suspects, to borrow another cinematic line. If you had come, as I did, from a place where national leadership consisted of an autocratic emperor followed by a series of ever worse dictators, this was a revelation. If Cavalcade of America were on today, I think that one of its episodes would be devoted to Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. We heard his words in our reading. He was born in Ukraine, came to the US at age three. He risked and lost his senior job at the National Security Council after he testified at the October 2019 impeachment hearings about the abuse of presidential power. By today, we realize that democracy is fragile, but it also has strength. What I learned, not just from movies, but even more so from reading history, is that its strength arises not so much from group actions, which generally occur long after the initial spark, but more out of individual actions of citizens taking responsibility. Each such step weaves one strand that may appear fragile, but in its entirety becomes a strong web. So I'm going to share something that is out of fashion just now and may even be unpopular. I have a problem with group-centric initiatives no matter how well I am individually aligned with the group's aims. Actually, I have three problems. First, I think that our responsibility as citizens demands more of us than group initiatives. And this echoes our Unitarian Universalist fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We should be unafraid to stand up and let our own small voice be heard. It may even go viral. Second, I think that group actions such as protest rallies are no longer effective in shaping opinion in an age when so many rallies are held. Third and last, group actions make it hard to have a dialogue which starts with listening to folks with whom we disagree. Think of any protest and then reflect on the counter protest that trails behind it. Now let's imagine an alternative. Only individual engagement with those whose views differ from ours has a reasonable chance of changing their minds. This is a hallmark of civil behavior and one of the many duties of full civil rights. This can be tough as was demonstrated by my experience just last month in Germany with a fellow tourist sitting across the table from me in Rotenburg. He said that he liked that we were eating at the Gasthaus Glocke because it reminded him of a Glock pistol. The first instinct was to turn away, move on to another conversation. But the alternative was better. When we engage those with whom we disagree, we at least stand a chance of influencing their thought. 
This notion of engagement, of leaning into a difficult conversation instead of avoiding it, reminds me of my sailing San Francisco Bay. In summertime, this often means really heavy winds. And I had to really discipline myself to face the elements by turning the boat into the wind before I tried to reset the sails. Movies are often remakes of plots and characters that have been shown before, reruns, whether literal or figurative. History is like the movies, because history repeats itself only with differences. The presidency, Supreme Court decisions, an ineffective Congress, gerrymandered voting districts, we have seen them all before with a few differences in the tapestry that is American history. So finally, my two threads of movies and actual history intertwine. I'm not referring to Ronald Reagan. There is a sitcom, a total of 51 episodes over three seasons, called Servant of the People. It debuted in 2015. The storyline is simple, and it's straight out of Frank Capra. Amidst a presidential election, an ordinary 30-something high school history teacher gets really upset by the corruption in the country and its politics. He goes off on a rant in front of his class. One of his students records this outburst on a smartphone and then posts it on YouTube. It goes viral, even inspiring crowdfunding to finance the teacher's campaign. And improbably, the teacher is elected president. He then sets out on a vigorous campaign to end corruption. But Servant of the People is just a Netflix sitcom, you might say. It's not real. After all, it was conceived and produced by a comedian. Well, the comedian happens to be Volodymyr Zelensky, who shortly thereafter was elected as the real president of Ukraine. How do you build a magnificent structure? One brick at a time. Our new patio out there is a fine example, thanks to Nigel Deitch, his fellow scouts, and his parents, Elizabeth and Steve. But it wasn't built en masse. It wasn't built in total. It was built painstakingly one brick at a time. One step at a time takes leadership. As Henry Kissinger, who is now 99 years old, notes in his new book, Leadership, Six Studies in World Strategy, let me quote, leadership is most essential during periods of transition when values and institutions are losing their relevance and the outlines of a worthy future are in controversy, end of quote. So how do we rebuild our democracy and confidence in its institutions? One action, one email, one thread, a conversation with someone with whom you disagree, not using a megaphone, but one action by each of us. It isn't easy. It's certainly not duck soup. Shalom. <laughs>